nature swagger, Bill. We we talked with uh, someone who certainly has a lot of nature swagger and just a lot of swagger. A lot in of general. swagger in general. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we had we had Rue Map on today. Rue Rue is the the founder of a, a group called Outdoor Afro, but that's just one of many things that she is because boy, just a really unique human. Great story. Just passionate so much energy so much enthusiasm so much drive force of nature is not too mild a, a term for i mean she's an entrepreneur and and you know now getting in people involved in the outdoors in so many different ways uh, it's amazing yeah so i think folks are going to enjoy this because it it takes the it takes the listener took us on on some really interesting journeys just in in my mind my mind was running Right. It, it goes from everything from hearing her story of growing up with a dedicated outdoorsman father to being this entrepreneur who, you know, started writing books and getting people out and hunting and getting back into hunting and being on meat eater like, boy, just ran the gamut. <laughs> the things we haven't been invited to do. and We've been in this space for a long time. So, yeah, maybe uh, we're yeah, not she's, exceptional enough, Bill. I think this is she, an exceptional she's definitely a She's a special person. There's no doubt after talking to her. You, you knew it beforehand, but then after spending an hour with her, it's a special person. Yeah, Worth just a listen. gracious, beautiful human, doing the right things, awesome perspective. I think folks are going to enjoy this one. Check it out. Rue Map from Outdoors Afro. Since 1936, the National Wildlife Federation has worked with hunters and anglers to pass the most important conservation laws of American history and to protect our sporting traditions. This podcast explores our history, our values, and the work we do to safeguard the fish and wildlife that fuel our passions. We are NWF Outdoors. Good morning, everybody. This is your host, Aaron Kindle, and I'm here with my good buddy, Bill Cooksey, today. How's it going, Bill? All good, man. We finally had a cold front and some rain come through to at least dampen down the dust we're feeling in this part of the country. That's that's good news. We we always need some some precipitation no matter where we are. Uh, <laughs> I'm here in Santa Fe, New Mexico with my colleagues uh, from our public lands team at, at the National Wildlife Federation. We're uh, doing some planning and got the chance to go out and see some good stuff on the landscape, the Caja del Rio area which is a hugely important archaeological, historical, cultural area here. So many petroglyphs. I mean, the concentration of petroglyphs and, and stories that are on these rocks up there are unreal. So happy to see that. And uh, But I also I'm glad we got to take some time aside here to have this conversation because it's one a long time in the making. And today we have a Rue Map on. Good morning, Rue. Hey, good morning. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area in the North Bay, um, right outside of Napa. So I'm thrilled to be able to come together um, across these various parts of the country and and chat together. Yeah, the, that's the beauty of technology. With all its uh, <laughs> with all its other problems, it gives <laughs> us sometimes. At least we're here together like this. So mm-hmm. thank you, Ru. Well, we're going to have a fun conversation today. I want to just tell folks a little bit about Rue if, they, if they've never heard of her, which I think that's getting harder and harder these days, Rue. You're, you're a, <laughs> a mover and a shaker, which uh, you certainly came across my desk a few different times. And um, I'll just tell folks a little bit about you, and then we'll, we'll jump into all kinds of stuff, and you can help us learn some more. Um, but Rue is the founder and CEO of a group called Outdoor Afro, and that's a new, I'll let her explain kind of what Outdoor Afro's mission and so on is and just give you a little bit more background. But she's also a National Geographic fellow. She's an author. Um, she's been on the, the show Meat Eater with, with uh, Giannis Patelis. Um, she a, has, a, has a really cool thing going called Black Heritage Hunts out in California that I hope she'll tell us a little bit more about. Um, she's just a known communicator, a known leader. Um, I'm going to let Rue fill in more of the detail because I don't want to, you know, uh, say it wrong, really. Uh, there's so much that's there, and, and I think that there's just so many stories here. So I'll just leave it at that, and then, Rue, we'll do a couple things. We'll let you tell us about all this, but then please share with us links and other things for, for ways we can put in the show notes and get our guests, you know, connected to all the other great work you're doing. 
Sure. Well, thank you so much for having me and for your generous comments. I mean, it's really been a tremendous blessing to be able to be on this path to help people reconnect to the outdoors. And I started Outdoor Afro as basically a kitchen table blog, just telling the story about growing up in the outdoors and all the things that my family instilled in me. My dad was from Texas, my mom from Louisiana. And while we mainly lived in Oakland, we had a hobby farm about a hundred miles north of Oakland. And it was about 14 acres, but it was, you know, an entire universe of exploration and connection to the outdoors. My dad hunted fish. We had a boat. Um, and it was just a lifestyle of being deeply connected and and really bringing a lot of those elements that we were able to you know harvest we had this bountiful garden and fruit trees and and grape vines and my dad even made wine <laughs> i mean he was just just about every aspect of being in the outdoors and and putting his hands on the land And the other thing that he was so um, determined to do was to share those experiences with other people. So we had people from our church, from our extended family in East Oakland, who would often come and visit. And as people would be sent away, you know, often with prayers and good wishes for safe travels, he'd always let people know, you have a standing invitation. And that basically meant that once invited, you were always welcome. And to this day, people talk about my dad's hospitality. He's no longer living. And so those values of welcoming and hospitality and really embracing all that nature has to offer are the values that sit at the heart of what Outdoor Afro is today. And it's evolved from that kitchen table blog to be a national not-for-profit organization. Um, We have 120 men and women we train to get people in their communities outdoors. And people are hiking and biking and doing all kinds of things in nature. We have 60,000 people in that participation network. And we also, I also have a pop-up community of people who are learning how to hunt so it's it's been a really wonderful journey of sharing of heritage of you know just really helping people to get their confidence back to connect with nature in whatever ways they choose that's awesome ruin you know i man i you, i've heard about your dad before i've heard you speak about him and man it, it seems like a cool guy someone you know it'd be fun to to sit around a campfire with and hear his stories and just be on that farm with him you kind of put me in in that place when you said it you know Mm -hmm. i can imagine wandering around with him and you know getting your hands dirty in the soil that's some of my favorite stuff too um i want to do one thing because we keep we keep glossing over this bill we always try to talk about what we've been doing outside a little at the beginning (laughs) of this with our guests and ourselves and just you know reconnect people a little bit at the beginning so maybe rue i can start with you have you been getting outside lately what have you been up to You know, not as much as I'd like to, because I've been in a really um, impacted schedule mode with a lot of things that I know we're going to talk about related to my book and product launch that's kind of put a dent in my hunting time. I did get out. uh, The last time I got out hunting was the day after the dove opener. And I'm just having a lot of FOMO right now with all my friends getting out into the blind and uh, duck hunting, but I am looking forward to doing some things um, through the month of November and December. But, you know, it really gets down to the basics for me and just walking my dog around the neighborhood and just being with, you know, my, my backyard, if you will, that gives me a lot of satisfaction. That's awesome. That's true. It does. Bill, what about you? Give us a little little flavor of your life right now well the downside is i haven't been fishing since september when i was in mississippi with johnny marquez fishing for triple tail my bass boat's oil uh, pump has gone out so i'm waiting on a thousand dollar part and (laughs) hopefully it won't come in until after duck season so i don't have to pay until after duck season but i've been squirrel hunting and uh, getting duck blinds ready 
we're right around the corner from season opening here. What about you, man? Well, besides being down here, you know, in New Mexico for work, um, just doing gearing up a little bit for elk hunting where I'll be out heading out for an elk hunt the day that this uh, podcast release here on Friday, which I'm really looking forward to with my kid. And then my kids just wrapped up their, their mountain biking season, the state mountain biking championships. Both my kids made it to oh, this wow. year. So we had that this last weekend here in Colorado and that was fantastic. Lots of youngsters trying as hard as they can and, and finishing up the season. My boy's a senior. So it was his very, last race i watched him cross the finish line for the last time in his mountain biking career so that's always a little bit you know <laughs> you know dad maybe had a little tear in his eye a couple times uh Absolutely. This past weekend. but uh good good stuff all around i'm glad we did that we've been sorry Rue, you were a little bit of a you were a little bit of a you know victim there of us skipping that uh, the last couple times or not doing it well enough and we, tr- we really try to ground this in the outdoors so thanks for entertaining that but let's no. get back to you it's great. You don't mind. Oh no, I love it. I love to hear about it. And congratulations um, on that. I, I totally relate. I'm a mom of three kids, and so I've had plenty of my own, you know, yeah. sport pride moments uh, around, you know, around different sports. So I love hearing about it. I believe you have a son who's a Marine too. Is that correct? Yes. My son, my youngest, the baby boy is now officially a U.S. Marine. And wow. he, um, he was super determined to do it. He, he, this was his path and he just got through boot camp last month and uh, he's now getting started with, and he's done combat training. And so he's now getting started with his uh, vocational training. And he told me, he was like, mom, it was the hardest thing I've ever done, which is exactly what you want to hear as a parent, because (laughs) you know, like if it was really hard that he values it. And also he's got the pride of, of accomplishing something that, you know, not, not, you know, not all the kids were able to make it through from what I hear. So Mm -hmm. it was a, a huge moment of pride to experience his graduation in San Diego last month. That's awesome. I mean, thank goodness there are young people like your son. Oh, tell me about it. That are still willing to serve. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad. I'm thankful for it, for that. And, um, you know, he's got a hundred percent support from our entire family. That's cool. Well, Rue, let's, let's go back to, to, you told us you gave us a nice little start there to kind of some of your your childhood and, and, you know, your, your first experiences in the outdoors, but let's maybe connect that to hunting a little too, because I know you have kind of some, a lot of hunting in your past and your family history. And, and then you didn't, you know, hunt for a while and maybe walk us through that journey, you know, kind of where you started there with your being with your dad on his farm and their history and, and getting to where you said, yeah, I'm going to go back and I'm going to get back into that. Yeah. I mean, there are a few things in play for me related to hunting. One was I I felt like hunting was dying in my family. Like my dad had passed away, the uncles and growing up, it was, you know, my uncles and my dad would, would go out and hunt and bring home game. And, and it would be, you know, the aunts and my women and uh, the women in the family um, who would, do the processing and I'd be on point for various tasks. So it was all hands-on situation. And I just remember not only the feeling of it, the pride in that, but also the delicious and diverse meals that I, you know, was able to experience from a young, from a young child. So we would be eating, you know, venison, we would be eating rabbit, squirrel, quail. I mean, just this wide range. And so I, as, as my parents' health declined and eventually they passed away, um, those traditions passed away with them and hadn't quite been taken up by any of our cousins or other relatives. And so it was this longing in my heart past the point of me, of course, you know, getting through young adulthood and starting a family where I wanted to get back into it. And I would say that the journey to actually become a hunter again probably took me about 10 years. And once I actually crossed back over into the hunting world, you know, I was able to appreciate 
one, how difficult it is to get into hunting if you don't have a network of support around you to educate you and to mentor you and uh and 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 a desire obviously especially because of what I was already doing through outdoor afro to just make sure there weren't more people like me out there who didn't know where to start who maybe had hunting in their family but it was it had died away and and so you know as I've learned, I've also been able to bring people along. And that's the thing I really appreciate about hunting. It's like, you don't have to know everything in order to bring someone along. So as I've learned, I've been able to bring people along and I've been supported greatly by my own hunting mentor, Holly Heiser, who took me under her wing during the pandemic. And we've pretty much been nonstop doing things together in a variety of hunting settings and opportunities. And then I've also had the chance to do a lot of hunting on my own, which has been a tremendous source of pride uh, for me, but it didn't start off easy. Um, It was actually a bit disastrous (laughs) getting into it again, but I came in with so much determination and clarity around my why that I wasn't deterred. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe you can explore that why for us a little bit more. You know, you talked about it a little bit, man, that's the good stuff, I think, the the real, you know, visceral human stuff. Yeah, so for me, it was it it was really personal because, you know, I had been speaking around the country and and getting coverage about outdoor afro um and that was a part of the story that I just felt was missing. You know, I, I, I was kind of glossing over, I mean, I mentioned it, but I didn't really go deeply into it. And so at some point I felt like that was a part of the story that I really needed to tell. I really needed to bring my father's experience, his influence on me into a much fuller light and hunting and fishing was of high priority and value to him in our whole lifestyle. And it just seemed like a huge miss to not share that part and also share it in the context of my own motivation to reconnect with hunting and also reconnect with those family values and habits that allowed me, I believe, to have a much more knowledgeable um, and appreciative uh, way of living with wildlife that I feel hunting has absolutely given me. You know, Rue, as I'm going through all your, your information and all, I noticed something that's kind of, I won't say unique, but it's not as common as it once was. Um, when I was younger, people tended to hunt everything, whatever was in season, they went after it. Uh, these days, we seem to be a, a group of specialists. I mean, somebody's a duck hunter or a deer hunter or an upland game hunter, and, and you're doing it all. And, and <laughs> Talk a little bit about that, and, and are you tempted to get into one thing or another, or are you enjoying the path on on all of this these different types of hunting? Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. I think that as part of my education, it was really important to hunt the widest range of species, but also through those you know very specific hunting experiences, there's a you know there's a variety of tactics and, and, uh, you know, ecosystems to explore. So I think, you know, if I want to call myself a hunter, I think, you know, it's really important to be somewhat of a generalist, but I do have, I absolutely do have a favorite. I mean, I love duck hunting. I think duck hunting really brings together so many things that I really love about the outdoors such as being near water, um, you know, of course, being there when the world wakes up, you know, before the sun comes up and to just be in that complete quiet and peace. Um, and I mean, ducks are tasty. <laughs> uh, so, Amen. And, 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 and they're fairly easy to process. They don't monopolize your whole kitchen, you know, in the way that larger game does for days on end. 
Um, so uh, there's just a lot of there's a lot of things I love about duck hunting for sure. But it's been really gratifying and and challenging uh, to be able to to do other types of hunting. You know, like pheasant hunting. I did pheasant hunting in Kansas at the at the uh, Ringneck Classic and um, had a chance to you know do some what I consider some pretty hard hunting. Um, I've had a chance to um, kill a buck in um, Wyoming um, that took me, you know, six different sits. And by the time I, you know, was able to finally shoot, I had the best opportunity and I took it five minutes before shoot time on the last possible day, 200 yards. And when that deer face planted, I mean, that was like, that the, the the rush of accomplishment um and the hug shared between me and my guide was was something I'll never forget and and to be able I just got married last uh, month and to be able to serve some of that venison to my guests you know was just like such a wonderful circle of life and 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 way to honor um you know, that wild game. So it's just been really important for me to have a variety of experiences. And I also recognize that some are just easier to come by than others, given I live in California and it's easier to hunt some species over others. But um, I really appreciate the variety and it just helps me to connect in with people and, 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 and eat some really delicious meals too. Well, I just knew when I saw all the ducks and, and the turkeys on your website I, that we were going to get along just fine. Those, <laughs> if you made me pick, I'd say, uh, I'm just glad that those don't occur at the same time of year. Right. Oh, turkey hunting. Oh, yeah. I definitely, I, yeah, that's a new passion too, thanks to Giannis, um, who who took me on a guided turkey hunt just this year in April and it was another hard hunt. It took, you know, a few days, it got down to the wire. Um, but man, it was incredibly satisfying. And, you know, again, um, for my wedding, I actually had turkey feathers in my bouquet and all of the groomsmen had turkey feathers in their boutonniere. So I really brought my whole outdoors woman uh, into the wedding for my new husband. <laughs> Ru, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you got connected up with the mediator folks. I mean, I think one thing that's interesting about that just on its surface too, is they're kind of like the leading, you know, most high profile, you know, hunting voice out there right now. And they're probably, I think they're doing a better job than most historic, you know, hunting fishing conversations in a lot of ways they're they're bringing it back to food a lot they talk about conservation you know they they don't always have to get the biggest hugest whatever to to you know express a successful hunt uh how did you get connected connected up with them and you know then and maybe you can tell us a little bit about that turkey hunt that you actually did an episode of mediator with yeah i mean first of all, okay, it was probably 2019. And I had, I, I had, I was just out with some colleagues after a board meeting with uh, the Wilderness Society. And the conversation of, you know, often will, you know, as a way to people getting to know each other, roll around to, well, what podcasts are you listening to? And so one of the people in our group, they said, hey, I'm really enjoying the meat eater podcast and I'm not even a hunter, but I really enjoy it. And as I mentioned before, I had wanted to get back into hunting for some years. And so I was definitely interested in checking it out. So when I did, I got it. I was like, oh, he's actually doing the same thing I'm doing. He's changing narrative. He's changing the narrative about who can be a hunter why choose hunting and he's bringing it full circle to the meal on the table and i love that and i connected with that deeply just the narrative arc of it right and i was also interested in getting back into hunting so i decided after a lot of thought i was like you know i'm just gonna reach out via email to whatever the info at on the website <laughs> And I'm going to just write a note and just let him know, hey, I see you. 
I am enjoying what I'm seeing and I'm here to be of support in any way I can possibly be. And you know how you send like these, you know, general info emails off into the night. You don't really expect to hear anything back, but it just felt good to get that off my chest, you know? So when, when he, when I, when I got the reply back from the producer, I was delighted and it led to a conversation and more exploration around what was possible. And we landed on this idea that I would come out in the following spring and do a turkey hunt with Giannis. And Giannis Patalis, for those who don't know, is um, the producer and um, co-host with Steve Rinella on the podcast. And, and so we had it all dialed in. They had sent me a bunch of gear to, you know, prepare myself. And lo and behold, the pandemic happened and our April 2020 Mm. Turkey hunt was pretty much nixed. So we just kind of, you know, like everybody else, we just, you know, sheltered in place and, and waited. And it wasn't until the following summer where we decided to reconnect. And, and, you know, and during the summertime, you know, the, the country was exploded around the, you know, the, um, the racial reckoning. And I recall they were very conscious that they didn't want it to appear that I was just showing up on their show in light of everything that was happening and the conversations that were happening all over the country. And so it was really important for everybody to know when we did do the podcast that one, I reached out to them and and it had taken a while just because of COVID and needing to, you know, not be around people, but we had that, we had a window of time where it felt okay for me to get on a plane and come out to Montana. And we had a delightful conversation about my upbringing, my work, and, and just some, some tough topics, you know, that were definitely on people's minds. But, you know, our conversation I felt was really balanced and, 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 and it was a, it was a turning point for me because everything that I had wanted to experience in getting reconnected to hunting actually was able to happen after that conversation. And around the same time, I was watching YouTube videos from Holly Heiser, who was running like a a women's learn to hunt program. And all of those programs had pretty much shut down around the pandemic because of course they involve overnight stays with people. So uh, I just reached out to her and she's like, Hey, I heard you on meat eater. And I was actually thinking about connecting with you anyway. And we were off from there. Um, I went on my first uh, dove hunt with her um, just probably a six weeks or so after that meat eater podcast. Um, but it was a really great experience to connect in with them. I, I brought my fiance then fiance at the time and you know, had some real good quality time with Steve and his family at their house for dinner after we did the podcast. And, you know, there's something really special when people invite you to their homes, um, because not everybody does that. You know, sometimes it's just all business. You get in, you get out. And, you know, we were very touched that he welcomed us um, to share a meal at his table at his home. And he, you know, gave us a ride to our hotel that evening. And, it was just a really wonderful way of just feeling like you're making new friends. And that has been the consistent experience I've had through hunting is the chance to really connect in deeply with people who you wouldn't probably have the chance to, to, you know, connect with in your day-to-day life based on where you live or what job you have. And it's really just been a, a lovely disruption of the usual patterns of connecting and getting to know people that I've really come to value as well. That's a cool story, Rue. You, you, you probably gave a lot of people who've thought, you know, should I cold call someone famous or someone that I, that I really appreciate and just see what happens? And, and you did it. And so that's, I love it. Uh, let, let's transition a little to outdoor Afro. Obviously we want to give you the opportunity to to talk about that and you know how that came to be and what you're trying to do and i think 
you know, I guess first I would just say, man, I admire so much of, of how you were talking about this because the theme is open-mindedness and willing to learn, right? And the way you've embraced all that stuff. And, I, and I'm sure when you tell us more about Outdoor Afro, we're going to see how you're helping others, you know, get those opportunities to learn too. So yeah. can you just give us the overview and, and, you know, where you're headed? Yeah, well, you know, Outdoor Afro, you know, as I mentioned before, started as just a kitchen table blog conversation. Um, I'd been writing about my experiences in the outdoors since I was 10. And it was a way for me to, you know, stay reconnected um, to those experiences time and again by, you know, going back and reading them. And, you know, this this experience of blogging um, really opened my eyes that there are a lot of people out there who had stories like mine, who had just one generation away from, you know, really close contact with nature and wildlife. And, you know, we're, we're, we're not, you know, being seen in the mainstream. Um, the mainstream magazines were not showing black people in the outdoors as strong, beautiful, and free. <laughs> you know, it was always this like narrative of, of, you know, lack or, you know, people were ignorant or just didn't have any connection or they just didn't do certain activities. Like all of these, you know, really whack stereotypes were, were just kind of the accepted norm. And I just knew that wasn't true in my life and my family's history. And by sharing that story, more people kind of came out of the woodworks and said, Hey, that's my story too. And so I knew, I realized we had like a visual representation problem. So I just put a lot of energy in those early years to really help shift the visual representation of who we imagine gets outside, but also who, who leads outside, who's got the expertise. And that evolved to becoming a national not-for-profit organization by 2015. And by that time, I was learning a ton. I was working with a lot of conservation organizations. I was actually learning about conservation for the very first time because even though my dad was an outdoorsman, you know, he wasn't a member of like Sierra Club or National Wildlife Federation or, you know, I didn't know about, you know, some of, I didn't know about, you know, uh, Theodore Roosevelt or um, John Muir, you know, like those were not you know, figures in my upbringing to talk about. And so I really, in those early years, cut my teeth on a lot of conservation education and ethic that aligned, um, quite frankly, with a lot of what I already knew and practiced through my family. And so now, you know, Outdoor Afro has, you know, you know, paid staff uh, in Oakland, California, and we've got this volunteer network that we train up and give them the best practices and tools for helping get people in their communities out into nature and largely through outdoor recreation, which is like, you know, the gateway drug, you know, you get people out hiking and, <laughs> and camping and um, becoming aware of wildlife habitat and, and identifying wildlife, you know, those are all the important building blocks for a life that is connected um, in a in a easy way uh, to nature, and that's really you know where I've been driving uh, this whole time is to really move you know specifically the black community into this place of the ordinary when it comes to their relationship with the outdoors, and I also got really in touch with the proud history of black outdoorsmen and just the ways that there were people who cared so much about their connection to the outdoors that like in the middle of Jim Crow, like the worst possible time in America that people still created these recreational havens to explore the outdoors. And they were also places where there were outfitters and guides who were all contributing to like what we now know is the outdoor economy. And, and I'm talking about places like Lake Ivanhoe and Lincoln Hills, you know, pe people who are like, okay, so what it, it, you know, there's segregation. So what I can't use this, you know, um, resort or beach or whatever, we're going to go and create our own. And I just was so struck by how that value and determination to connect to nature 
was just transcendent over the, the circumstances of the day. And today we don't have those, those signs that say you can't swim here, you can't recreate here. But I think that for some people, you know, there's a lasting like psychological legacy of what it is you can't do or where you can do it that we're really trying to disrupt and help remind people that, you know, our public lands and, you know, our places of recreation are here for everybody and, 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 and they're there for us to enjoy and steward, you know, um, like anybody else. And so by creating these opportunities for people to get outside and get familiar with these places has really been transformative for not only individual people, but really for the entire narrative about what people can expect of people in the Black community in this country as it relates to their outdoor engagement. I'm really proud of that. Howdy, listeners. For more great content, check out NWF Outdoors social media on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Connect with us. We want to hear from you. Send us your ideas for podcast guests and questions in the comments. And for even more excellent content, here's a message from our partner podcast. Hey everyone, this is Ashley Chance from Artemis Sportswomen. We know you love awesome stories about hunting, fishing, and conservation. So head on over to the Artemis podcast. You'll meet adventurous, accomplished women who are redefining conservation through their lives in the field and on the water. Filled with humor, audacity, empathy, and intelligence, Artemis brings you new voices and introduces you to women from all walks of the sporting community. Find Artemis wherever you get your podcasts. This, this may be more of an observation than a question, but I'd love it if uh, maybe you can elaborate on it a little bit. Uh, just from my experience, I grew up on a farm in rural West Tennessee, and in the mid-80s, I went to Southern California to Cal State Northridge and went to school, and it was the late 90s before I really got moved back close to home. And when I was a kid, all the way through high school, you didn't think twice about seeing African Americans out hunting. You know, I mean, it was a common thing. You know, mm-hmm. you'd look out off one side of a highway and you might see a couple of white guys out there hunting. And on the other side, there'd be a couple of black guys out there hunting. And nobody ever thought twice about it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I I grew up, the, the closest family to me was an African American family. And I rabbit hunted with them all the time. They had great dogs and it was a blast. Um, but by the time I moved back between ag changes and land use changes, and I'm sure we lost a lot, you know, we lost a lot of people in general during that time. But but we definitely seem to have lost a generation of African American hunters yeah. because it just I didn't see them anymore. It's becoming more common now, and that's a good thing because conservation needs all of us. Period. Yep. You know, if it if for no other reason, conservation needs us all. But yep. is that common throughout the country? Yeah, I mean, I think you bring up a great point. Um, around how people have migrated away from country life to cities played a factor in the, you know, just the lack of day-to-day connection and opportunity. Um, And there has been also generational land loss too um, that's occurred, um, you know, with, with many families in the South. Um, I've got a, a, a young woman who, works on our team and she's a fourth generation cowgirl and landowner. And, you know, she's, you know, shared her personal story of how challenging and, and even backbreaking it's been for families to hold on to land. And so I think that those are, those are real factors that play into the lack of connection and familiarity. But, you know, today there's a new narrative that we can tell about how even if you live, I mean, I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. So I, and I'm thankful um, for this, but a lot of people don't know, like I, they're hunting opportunities within an hour of where most people live here, even, even in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, so I just think, you know, we've got to do a better job of helping people remember that past, that, that easy way that people just aligned with 
their hunting opportunities or opportunities to grow gardens and just be in general connection um, to the present moment and how we, we can recreate those opportunities and live much more enriched lives while also having the kind of heart and relationship for our public lands and wildlife um, that I agree all hands need to be on deck for. Rue, maybe too. I mean, you know, the way you're doing it at Outdoor Afro is kind of unique too. You have these different hubs, if you will, across the country. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about how that operates and, you know, what kind of activities you're undertaking and how those folks are doing this cross country. Yeah. So we, 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 every year we do recruitment. Um, it's coming up for people to become an Outdoor Afro volunteer leader. And it's pretty, I mean, I'm not a believer of like just vanity metrics, like, you know, numbers for the sake of numbers. Like I'm really interested in getting the right people engaged who want this volunteer opportunity and who can be consistent in bringing their local community together. And like the old models, you know, I'd done a lot of work, as I mentioned before, with conservation organizations, environmental organizations, and the their theory of change was always a bit problematic for me. It was always like about going to the hood and, you know, getting people into uncomfortable outdoor experiences for some kind of breakthrough or metamorphosis to happen. And then everyone's, you know, patting themselves on the back after they've taken their photos and, you know, like something really is going to be different. Right. And I was always curious. I'm like, well, what happens to that family or that young person when they go home? Like, will they have the tools to continue to do these activities without the program? And so there was this weird kind of dependency on programs to get people outside, which I just thought was just not, if, first of all, it wasn't how I was raised. I I learned what I learned about nature and the outdoors through my family and so I, I really got clear that these outdoor Afro volunteer leaders needed to be people who you could relate to, who were in communities that they lived, where, you know, on an experience with them, you can talk about, you know, where to go get your hair cut, who's serving the best soul food right now, um, <laughs> you know, and be people you could really connect with, like there are people in your family. And what I also realized is the best volunteer leaders were not folks who had a wildlife, you know, biology background or had, you know, a degree in outdoor rec. The, the people who ended up being the best outdoor leaders and continue to be are folks of all vocations, school teachers, military vets, firefighters, real estate professionals, and the list goes on. And people take the rigor from their personal life and apply it easily into being an outdoor Afro volunteer leader. And they're tasked to get people out once a month and they can choose the activity that they want to do. And we provide a weekend um, full of training once a year, bringing everybody together to talk about risk management, trip planning and logistics, the role of communication, policy, Um, And just giving them this toolkit that they can then take into their community and get people in the outdoors sustainably. Um, And as I mentioned, you know, we've got nearly 120 men and women who are in this year's class and the participation network in more than 30 states is about 60,000 people who are doing, if you can think of it, Outdoor Afro is doing it. Now, Outdoor Afro is not involved with hunting or leading hunting activities. Um, Although there's a significant number of outdoor Afro leaders who are hunters and anglers, and we do do some uh, fishing clinics. Um, We've had the benefit of partnering with um, the uh, National Parks Foundation, National Wildlife Federation, um, and other organizations in, in, you know, at smaller scale um, to get people more aware and to do, you know, some of these beginner, um, you know, angling um, activities that absolutely open a door for more. 
That's awesome, Rue. I mean, it, the, the kind of the the extent that you've been able to grow it to already, right? You're talking sixty thousand people. I mean, that's that's an incredible impact. And and I think the other part that I I really love about it is it's it's really in a lot of ways a community building exercise, you know. And we oh yeah, we do it, right? Like trying to get trying to feel like help people feel like you have partners in this game, right? In this thing that we're all trying to do to, to, to create better outcomes for fish and wildlife and people and air and water and all the things that we, you know, do at NWF. But that, that I, I just, again, I just admire how you're doing it. And, and, and that, that kind of, you know, network of people, we, we have Artemis, which you and I talked about a little bit and, we kind of almost do that same kind of thing with Artemis, right? We have ambassadors across the country. We're building community. And then what we, what, what that ends up being is something that's more like a, you know, it, it, it a community is really the only word I can come up with, but it's a it support is. network, right? It that that you, when you go to feel something or you're feeling something or you need help, then you have people to turn to. That's and it just, right. And it, that's right. And, you know, 60,000 people, like I said, I'm not a big fan of the vanity metrics because, I mean, let's keep it a buck. I mean, there's over 40 million black people in the United States. So we got rungs to climb, I think, to have the kind of sweeping impact that's possible. And the way that we actually get to bigger numbers is through our application of digital media and doing, you know, podcasts like this, you know, to help more people hear about it, see it, become inspired, even if they never get out with us. You know, if we can touch and move people to begin thinking about getting more into the outdoors, more involved in the outdoors and why it's important to do so, um, then, you know, that that is, I mean, it's really about driving culture change in the same way like that. And I mentioned this a lot, um, you know, I'm a Gen X born in 1971. So I spent probably the first, what, you know, 10, 12 years of my life seeing people smoking cigarettes everywhere at the bank, (laughs) uh, on the plane, the train. But, you know, at some point there was, there was greater awareness about the health consequences, but it wasn't enough to give people those statistics. It was about those, nonprofit champions, public relations, changes in policy, you know, the list goes on. All these I mean levers and pulleys that evolved over time and created a new norm where if you were to, you know, light up, you know, in a public place or at a restaurant, you know, that's that's absolutely exceptional and even forbidden. And so I really love the idea that, you know, if we're, if we're doing it right, it's going to take time. It's going to take a lot of different types of stakeholders to get to a new normal where being black in the outdoors simply feels ordinary. I'm glad you said that, Ruby, because I was just hanging on a question I wanted to ask you. And that is, you know, what we see a lot, right? Like Artemis, we, we talked about for a minute. I think if Artemis is ultimately successful, we kind of don't need Artemis, right? Because well, here's the thing. we didn't I, you know, I, 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 you know, and I thought about that a lot. Um, you know, like, do we need a black focused organization? I think we're always going to need affinity group organizations. Like I think about when I was a new mom in the Bay Area, I needed to find a mom's group in the Bay Area. Now that mom's group never said, moms from Salt Lake City aren't welcome or <laughs> or dads aren't welcome you know but it was it was very comforting to be a new mom in a group of other new moms who were in my geographic location who I could talk to about where to go and do stuff buy stuff learn stuff and it was just it was a really relevant you know kind of a group i think about being a girl scout You know, like when I was a Girl Scout and I was just in this troop of little girls and we're all like taking our turns being leaders at different activities. I just think about how that and, you know, other experiences, what they did was help build my confidence and prepared me to be able to connect with the larger world and universe in in a way that 
I may not have felt, you know, as prepared for and certainly not as confident to do. And so I think that even though affinity groups, you know, will continue to exist, I think that their focus is likely to shift as more people get involved. I, I love your talk about the sustainability aspect of it because all of these uh, uh, can be daunting to get into hiking, biking, uh, camping, hunting, fishing. Uh, and we've learned in the past, you know, take a kid hunting's great, take a kid fishing's great. But if they don't have a path forward to do it on their own, they got one experience. Right. Um, so I think that's kind of what we're talking about here. And with that in mind, I, I want to ask you about Black Heritage Hunts um, and, and what that is. Yeah. Well, I mean, as I mentioned before, you know, my journey back into hunting was long. And when I finally did actually get to the point of being ready to pull a trigger, it was still hard. And I just thought, gosh, you know, this has got, there's got to be an easier way for other people if they want to get into this. And, you know, just like with Outdoor Afro being, you know, experienced with doing that, um, it was easy to kind of pivot some of the methodology uh, into doing something similar, more focused on hunting. And Holly and I, you know, she'd been working on helping women get into the hunting space for years. And she's just such a great, thoughtful teacher. She's just, if you want to learn something hard, learn from Holly is all I have to say. She's just so good at helping break down you know, complicated things into digestible pieces. And so that was the unique thing that she brought to the conversation. And then of course, I, I'm a convener, I'm an inviter, I'm a hospitality person. So the two of us came together with this idea of doing a black heritage hunt. And we were successful at bringing together uh, some folks for the very first time uh, last duck season. And brought also mentors to be with these new hunters in the blind. And we also brought in our friend, Jonathan Wilkins of the black um, duck revival. He's a gentleman who's probably one of the most thoughtful and, and brilliant thinkers um, in this space that I've come across who speaks specifically to the history of black Americans and their, and, and their hunting uh, contributions. And so he, he's also a wild game chef. So I brought him out so that people not only had the experience of hunting, but they got the education on breakdown as well as how to use every part possible on a duck to produce delicious meals. And so we had hunting demo and just some, you know, other delicious soul food along the way. Um, We were at a well-appointed duck club uh, by... Cal- that was uh, hosted by California Waterfowl Association, who was our sponsor. And great it was, group. It was a really, and I'm a lifetime member of um, CWA. And so it was just a really great way to bring together all the things that we knew how to do, what we ex- had experience doing, to create yet another new and transforming experience for people who are wanting to learn how to hunt. And we're doing it again. We have it all set. Um, to do it. And we're sold out with a wait list as long as our capacity. So I don't want to, I don't want (laughs) to promote it, but if you want to, but if you want to learn about the black heritage hunt, our why, and to see photos from last year, um, go to blackheritagehunt.com. And we also have black heritage hunt on Instagram that shares photos and other things. And it's a great place for me because I'm able to, you know, have that be my pop-up playground and focus on hunting where I can share, you know, my grip and grins and things that maybe other people, and I'm very respectful of where people are. Like I'm not a bulldozer about this hunting journey and expect that, you know, everybody wants to see, you know, the breakdown and all of the other parts of it that, you know, are a part of the experience. So the Black Heritage Hunt is a forum for more candid sharing about the hunting experience from beginning to end. And Rue, is that, it, it, 
who who comes to those kinds of things? Is it just open to the public? Do you kind of you know curate a list? How do, how do you get folks engaged in that? Yeah, we just got you know people who who applied via social media promotion, um, and I and so it's and we don't of course discriminate, and I don't do I don't I don't play any of those discrimination games with even outdoor Afro. I mean, anybody's welcome to come. Um, I think we even have a white lady who's going to join us this year. So for me, it's, it's really about being as specific as possible about the invitation and anybody who wants to opt in can. That's amazing. I I, I love that. And Jonathan, man, he's someone also I've admired very much. If you, if you see him, tell him we want to talk to him too, because I've kind of followed him. I've thought about trying to get him For on the sure. podcast. I think I did that cold call reach out one time like you, Rue, but I didn't have the same results. So yeah, give him he, a Yeah, I definitely will 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 uh share this podcast with him. I did a podcast with him myself after our Black Heritage Hunt. You should take a listen to because we were just coming fresh off that experience and He's just a great thinker and 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 he's someone who I feel has so much to contribute to these discussions and he's actually going to come back for the Black Heritage Hunt this year so I'm really looking forward to to just spending time with him and I have had a chance to spend time with him at his duck um camp and lodge that he converted from a black church um to create, you know, a space that is welcoming to all kinds of people to learn and, and hunt. And, uh, you know, I just think he's, he's making some really great contributions in this space from where I sit. Yeah. Well, th- thanks for sharing that too. I think, you know, the theme here, uh, Rue is you're kind of a gravitational force. Look at all these amazing people that, you know, in our space, we think of the hunting folks. That's who we're a little bit most familiar with. And boy, you've got the all-star list in, in, in just a handful of years here where you've decided to dive back in of folks you're, you're hanging out with and working with. So that's pretty cool stuff. I want to give you a chance too to talk. You, you just released a book um, yeah. and you're here. Tell us about Nature Swagger. Yeah, so my very first book, Nature Swagger, is like you can get on any, you know, website or, you know, where you prefer to buy books. And uh, the actual release date is November the 1st. So um, now's the time at the time of this taping uh, where you could actually purchase it and get it right on time for the sale date. And, you know, it was so important to me to you know, take that diary and grow it up from that 10 year old perspective and expand it to include voices of people and their experiences from all over the country and really highlight this diversity within the diversity of the black experience that, you know, will look different depending on where people live or what kinds of activities they like to do. And I'm just so proud and thankful to have a book that really centers joy versus peril and pain. And again, the, the narrative, the narrative, you know, has been so much about, you know, the lack or the, the danger and, and, and the overcoming testimony. And I think that that's important, but I just felt in my bones, you know, this urgency, especially around 2020, when I was really in the thick of it, that the world needed to see another view of what black people could do and be. And I knew that nature was a really important source of healing and, and connection and even transformation for people. And, and just really telling the story of being strong and beautiful and free was something that was so important even for me personally during that time to be able to turn to these narratives and, and my own writing through it um, to find, you know, that source of, of strength and, and hope. And, and it's a kind of book that is, is something that anyone can enjoy. You don't even have to be, a, you know, a hardcore reader. Not everybody loves to read, you know, things from cover to cover, I know. And so it's filled with beautiful photography that capture the spirit of each contributor. And you can just pop in, read a short story, put it down, come back to another section. And so, you know, I wanted a six-year-old to get just as much out of the book through experience as, you know, a grown-up. 
Um, so, so the accessibility is really built into the, the way the book is laid out and, and the ways that, you know, people can, you know, open the book and see someone who might look like a family friend or someone, you know, who you know at work or, or someone you think is kind of cute. <laughs> so, um, you know, there's, there's a little something for everybody there. That's awesome. And Rue, like, why now? I, I mean, you talked about it maybe a little there at the beginning, but you know, you've got this amazing journey. And you know, what was it at this moment that you said, you know, I'm going to tell some of these stories, I'm going to bring these folks together, I'm going to, I'm going to tell these now. Because I think that's an interesting way of kind of, you know, intersecting with this book right now. Yeah, I mean, I felt like, you know, over the last, you know, now 13 years of doing outdoor Afro, I've continued to be a learner um, and really connect with people, whether I've met them at conferences or through outdoor Afro experiences or through um, the outdoor Afro volunteer network. You know, I just had heard so many beautiful stories um, of people who, you know, had just, you know, found their joy and found like, you know, or, or, or had moments of revelation in their life through a connection to nature. And so I really felt like it was time to grow up the conversation from, you know, the inner city kid getting out into wild, you know, outdoor experiences to talking about what already is happening and, and really, you know, shine a light. And these are not, the people in the book are not necessarily famous people, although many are accomplished in their own right professionally. It wasn't really about like this this, this show of peak experiences, the tallest mountain, the the longest hike, the biggest, you know, buck. This was so much more about, you know, meditations and, and visions of, of everyday connectedness. And so I felt like I was ready because of all of the stories that I felt were contained in me through experience. And also I felt like the world needed to see something different. Um, And it's not just about positive. It's just about, you know, complexity and nuance and, and relatedness and connection that I feel we don't have a lot of opportunity to experience in our day-to-day life. If you live in one geographic area and you see the same people all the time, um, you know, you're, you're going to be limited to understand um, more about people in a greater dimension. And so this was just a, a way of showing some depth and dimension uh, to the black community as it relates to the outdoors. And, uh, and, and especially, you know, over these last few years where it's just been really hard to talk about race and talk about just difference overall, I wanted to, you know, provide an easy entry for anyone uh, to be able to, to join in on this conversation of, of celebration, as well as a, uh, a remembrance of some important history that black people have with the outdoors that we get to continue to build on today. Thank you for that, Rue. I think, I mean, uh, one thing you said there was the nuance, right? I, I've really been trying to make a commitment to operating in the nuance, right? It, it's so, it things like, seems like so many things these days politically, right, are dichotomous. It's like, it's either this or that. And I'm like, yeah. that's not how people are. Yeah. That's not how humans are. We, I don't want to be one or the other. I want to be both or neither or you yeah. know, somewhere in between. And I, I think you're, one of the things that I really admire about what you're doing is you're, you're unpacking some of that, right? And you're, and you're telling those stories and you're, and you're showing the, the depth and richness to all of these things that are different than you know, just those simple narratives that we hear about all the time. Yeah, I mean, the book is, is interesting too, to me, you know, as a kind of an outside viewer, there's no book like it, you know, that's been written before to showcase what it, it it's, it's um, you know, sharing with the range um, that it has. I mean, we, we're talking about hunting. We're talking about uh, liquor. <laughs> we're talking about, you know, <laughs> we're talking about little little kids learning how to swim. Um, we're, we're talking to a 99-year-old, you know, who learned how to swim at a camp with Lena Horn. I mean, there's just like such diversity and, and some unexpected things that I'm really looking forward to people getting a chance to, 
connect with and 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 come away with you know to your point a more nuanced view of how people are connecting to the outdoors and you say november 1 is the release date on the book yes november 1 is the actual release date but you know being just days away at this you know conversation um i really encourage people to get on and just look up nature swagger and for those who want to know what nature swagger is because i don't i don't really spell it out in the book but you know i've been using the term for a few years and it just kind of popped into my head as the thing we're trying to get to and that is this confidence and ease and and knowledge of nature that informs your day-to-day life you know whether it be you know knowing you know and anticipating, you know, what you can do during different seasons and being prepared and ready for that and being able to extract the most sustainability um, from those changes um, to, you know, maybe city people um, getting excited about and knowing what to expect at the farmer's market this week. Um, so nature swagger for me, you know, is is really the true north that I, I can envision for anybody to move through the world and, and, and move, you know, with a conscious connection to the natural world. Well, I have the pre-order pulled up, so I'm doing that as soon as we get Yay! on. Yay. Awesome. I'll do the same Rue, and We'll, we'll put links in the show notes um, for, for folks to find it just immediately through the show notes as well. I, I got one. I know you got to run here soon. I've got one more question for you and then maybe an offer. Uh, if you'll entertain it. Um, the first one is, I, I think, you know, you're in a unique place. You know, we at National Wildlife Federation have been working hard on our, on our, what we call DEIJ. I think most folks know what that means, right? Our, our work to, to be better at diversity, equity, inclusion, and, and, and environmental justice efforts, real focus on environmental justice now. But I think you're in a unique place, you know, to help folks at this time, considering how much that's progressed and, and where we're at, because, man, that there's lots of those conversations have come to a head in the last, you know, few years. The, the, the pandemic certainly brought some of them to a head. Can you can you tell us, you know, what do you think, you know, as we're going through this journey, what should we be thinking about that's a little bit new or, or nuanced or, you know, as we're trying to get better at that and still keep making progress? You know, give us your take on that. Yeah, I mean that's like like a holy grail question, you know. Like, I know. Everyone wants to know that, and I'll I'll be frank with you. I'm not I'm not a I'm not a DEI expert. I don't I don't I don't speak about it. That's just that's just not my lane. You know, there's people who, you know, study and um you know that's the shingle they've got hanging out in front of their door, right? And that so that's not mine. And it really for me always boils down to this. And that's make new friends. Like nothing happens faster than the speed of relationships. And until you're willing to make new friends, like I've made new friends through the hunting experience that I've had over the last couple of years, like I'm talking about, you know, when you spend hours with someone in a blind, there's a connection there that no DEI consultant is going to teach you. You know, like I went on my duck, uh, I'm sorry, my deer hunt in Montana with a guy who could not be more different than me on paper. But when I killed that buck, you know, in the last possible moment that I had in that experience to do so, the smile on his face, that thousand megawatt smile on his face, the way we both just hugged each other up was transcendent. And I just think that if, if you put yourself in situations where you get to really do some deep hanging out with people, you will be able to have a better connection and understanding. It just comes with the territory. And that's, that's where I sit in really all my work. You know, I can't, I don't have the steps to tell you, you need to do this or that, or, you know, a lot of that is just, you know, for me is a lot of, you know, fixing to do something, 
but it's not really doing something. And, and so I just, you know, go make some new friends, you know, and, and just pour, like, like what I did with hunting, just give yourself over to it completely. If that's what you're interested in doing. And I think, you know, there comes a time when I think folks just need to get honest about whether or not they're willing to do that. Beautifully said, Drew. I, I love that. That's thank you for that. Uh, I know you got to go. Uh, my offer, one, one of my offers is I, I, in, in researching you, I haven't seen anything about an elk hunt, you know, and we're out here in Colorado. There's, there's a couple elk around here. So if you ever, if you ever get the desire to, to find some elk, you're welcome in my home and where I go and come out and do that. If you get the chance. Oh, um, yeah. oh I, I would love that. That's definitely, definitely on my list. Um, I actually had a conservation hunt lined up to uh, get cow elk up in the Pacific Northwest a couple years ago. And I wasn't able to do it. Um, some, something came up. So it's definitely um, something I'd love to do. Um, I did get a tag for Colorado last year, but I wasn't able to use it. So I've gotten up cl- close to the opportunity. And so maybe, maybe your offer will push me right over the edge and uh, help, me, help me fill my freezer. Take, take him up on it, Rue. I've known him five years, and I still haven't had that invitation. So. <laughs> well, thank you. Oh, it's an open invitation. He's he's fibbing a little there, Rue. But uh, uh, the last thing, you know, is anytime you you need something from us from NWF, please please reach out. We'd be happy to help with with the amazing stuff you're doing. Um, and you and I guess been, just you all have been amazing. I just I do I cannot get off the line without thanking NWF for being consistent donors and supporters, uh, program partners. The chair of my board is a staffer, Beth Pratt, uh, who's been my chair on the board of Outdoor Afro for the last six years, you know, and so there's a lot of different ways um, that I've been able to work with NWF, maybe quietly, but it has been deeply felt and appreciated. And so, you know, please, please know that a, we're, we're already, you know, out the gate on so much um, in this work through just thought partnership and collaboration. So let's keep it going. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Well said. Uh, any wise words from you, Bill, before we let Rue go? You know, um, normally we we're talking so many heavy conservation down topics or, or scary topics. And this this is a great topic because it's something all of us should be excited about is new people getting involved in hunting and fishing because that's the only way we're going to continue to have this. And so I'm going to encourage everyone out there, if you hunt or fish, it's sometimes counter to our nature because we like to have our spots to ourselves, that sort of thing. But that's that's a bad thing. That's a bad mindset to be in. If you can help someone forward if they're interested in hunting and fishing and you can help move them towards that and help them along the way, whoever it is, do it. Just do it. Yeah, I love that. I mean, gosh, I would I, I don't know what I would give to know my dad's hunting spots and he's no longer living, you know, to, to, to tell me. Wise words from both of you, Rube, uh, before I give us the official sign off, any any last words you want to share with us? Well, I always let people know you don't have to have an Afro to feel like you can be a part of Outdoor Afro. And, you know, as I've mentioned before, you know, we've we've got so many champions of all hues who are supporters on our staff and on our board. And um, and I just, you know, I, I do, especially in these times, I think it's important that people understand that this work is so much about that hospitality and welcoming and um, and I just want to invite people to join me in that. Thank you, Rue. And, and we're proud and honored you, you chose to spend some time with us today. It's, it's been a really unique conversation. My head was just running the whole time with different concepts and ideas. And you really got me thinking. So thank you so much. And let's keep talking. Let's let's talk about ways NWF Outdoors and perhaps Artemis and, and some of our sporting work can maybe interface and help out and, and do this good work that you're, that you're taking so many folks down. And just thank you so much for coming. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure having this conversation and I hope it won't be the last. <laughs> thank you, Rue. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. For more great content, check out NWF Outdoors social media on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter.
Connect with us. We want to hear from you. Send us your ideas for podcast guests and questions in the comments. We are NWF Outdoors.